Every bird is sung a single night of our grave. The creation sings, oh, this is so alive. So alive. Now you come, the words, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or cry. For once you have spoken, yeah, on the survey signs, follow the sound of your voice. And as you speak, a hundred you billion creatures get your heart.
These are ministry opportunities, a way that you can get connected at Lincoln Community Church. Mom, it's a Montgomery County, it's a, what's it called again? I'm terrible, my brain just went blank. Mill County United Ministries. See, it takes me a minute to get there, but eventually I do. <laughs> Um, we call it food donations during the month. You can leave them here in the donation box that's in the back, or you can bring them over to the Hope House right next door to the church, to the church offices. And uh, John Lee is very kind. He comes once a month, he picks them all up, and takes them down there, and they're to meet the needs of families in Montgomery County that are having a hard time. So if you'd like to donate, they, they take just about anything, canned foods, uh, beans, cereals, anything that will help out our families in need. And we'll ask for your mask. If you're not up here, you have to have your mask on once you're in the building. Thank you so much. You all have your masks on. I'm horrible. I always take one off and forget I have it all. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. No children. But normally this would be the time <laughs> that the children can be downstairs. Okay, can you be prayer now? Miss Angie. Let's worship and kneel down before the Lord our Maker. For we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We are the flock under his care. We thank you, Father God, that we can come into your presence this morning. Not because of works of righteousness which we've done, but according to your mercy, Amen. you have saved us and you washed us. And you've renewed us by the Holy Spirit. And we come. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time where we can remember, stop and peer and remember what you have done for us. You, were you came, you were born to die that we could live. We thank you for that. We thank you for that. And we, as we sung, we wait, we wait for you. Our soul longs for you. We look forward because we know that when you return, everyone will recognize that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, for every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. We thank you and we worship you this morning. We thank you that you are our high priest who sympathizes with us in our weakness. You were tempted in every way as we are, yet you were without sin. And you tell us to come boldly and confidently to your throne to receive mercy and grace to help in our time of need. Father, we are needy people. We thank you that we can come to you you are the God who daily bears our burdens. And we come to you this morning. Father, among us there are those who are sick, and we bring them to you. We bring to you those that are dealing with COVID. We think of Maria's family. Father, just heard the news. Father, we think of Nina and Mejia. We think of many others. We think of Abe's family who's sick. Sheila Pacone is sick this morning. Father, forgive us for taking our health for granted. Thank you that you are the God who heals Jehovah Rapha, and we call out to you, and we call out to you for healing. Again, your healing touch upon our sister Heather, upon Charlie Johnson, and that you, Father God, would be glorified in all of this. For the story is about you, not so much about us. So may we be the lights that you have called us to be in the midst of darkness. Father, bring to you Fred Perlinger's friend John in Florida. We bring to you Carol Brown. We bring to you Michelle Holland. There are so many, Father, 
But thank you that you know each one and how many hairs are on their head. And we ask, Jehovah Shammah, that your presence would be with them even now. We thank you for the privilege we have to come together to worship you. And we remember our brothers and sisters throughout the world, Father, who are being persecuted many severely. As they read your word, as they seek to meet together, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are with them. And we pray, Father, especially at this time for those who are being imprisoned, for those who have lost their lives and the loved ones that remain, that you would minister. Father, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for our pastor and Jen and the girls. We ask you, God, for a spirit of refreshment and encouragement for them. We pray for Jen's parents and all the, the situations that they need wisdom for, and we ask that you would give it generously, knowing that you will. We pray your special anointing upon our brother who has come to share your word, and we thank you for the power of the word to change us, to transform us. So today, soften our hearts, O oh God, Remove our hearts of stone. Give, give us hearts of flesh that we would not merely be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning. Morning. How's everyone doing? It's good. It's good. It's good. I know we had some good holidays. You could give me like a quick hand clap if you had some good time for Christmas with family. Yes, I think we do. Um, all right, so we're going to read this scripture together. Uh, I'm going to actually ask you guys to read along, read up there on the screen. And uh, I like the New Living Translation version better. Um, and since that's what we have up there, I'll just ask you guys to read along with me. Actually, I can pull it up on my phone. That's a good idea. Put your mask off. Oh, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> just wanted you guys to know where I stand. No. All right. So we're in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22. It's a lot of reading, but I promise the sermon is still going to be a good moderate amount of time but we really need this section to this entire section to really capture the meaning of what solomon is trying to communicate and even bigger than that what the message of the bible is trying to communicate it's proverbs chapter 8 verses 22 As it's on. Okay. It happens. It's late though. It happens. Mm -hmm. Okay, be quiet. That's what that means. Oh, okay. You want me to keep going while we're figuring it out? You, you keep going. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right. Um, so, Proverbs chapter 20, 18, starting at verse 22. We can read, the Lord formed me from the beginning before he created anything else. I was appointed in ages past at the very first before the earth began. I was born before the oceans were created, before the springs bubbled forth their waters. Before the mountains were formed, before the hills I was born. Before he had made the earth and fields and the first handfuls of soil. I was there when he established the heavens when the dew, the horizon on the oceans, when he drew the dew on the horizon on, on the oceans. I was there when he set the clouds above, when he established springs deep in the earth. I was there when he set the limits of the seas so they would not spread beyond their boundaries. And when he marked off earth's foundations, I was the architect at his side. I was his constant delight, rejoicing always in his presence. And now happy I was with the world he created. 
how I rejoiced with the human family. And so, my children, listen to me, for all who follow my ways are joyful. Listen to my instruction and be wise. Don't ignore it. Joyful are those who listen to me, watching for me daily at my gates, watching for me outside my home. For whoever finds me finds life and receives favor from the Lord. But those who miss me injure themselves. All who hate me love death. And I could, if I could give you a title for today, the title would simply be this. Wisdom's appeal to our soul. Wisdom's appeal to our soul. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. I pray at this moment that you allow your word to flourish. Would it not be me? Would people not see me? But would people come to relationship with you? Um, would we grow and continue to move forward in, your, in our faith and in wisdom? And it's in your name that we say amen. amen. So if you're like me, you may spend a lot of time just thinking, reflecting on your life and you know, by now, you've probably had a lot of Christmases. You've seen a lot of Christmas trees. You've had a lot of Christmas dinners. You've probably even been to a lot of Christmas services, right? You guys are probably familiar with the system of how you get all nostalgic and sentimental during Christmas time. And then that kind of propels you to the new year where you start saying, yes, in 2022, I'm going to be a new me. And then February comes and you're eating the things that you said you weren't going to eat and you're doing the things that you said you weren't going to do. And this cycle kind of continues. And if you're like me, at some point you start to ask the question, what is going on? Maybe this isn't you and maybe you've kind of already got this figured out. But for a lot of us, we start to realize that, man, when I think of all the services that I've been to, all the sermons that I've heard, all the Bible that I've read, all the different things that I've taught people. If I looked at what I knew in comparison with what I did, man, I would be a strong Christian. I mean, I can talk to somebody else about their life and about how what all these different little ins and outs and nuances to the way I understand their spiritual life. But I don't know. It's like I listen to a sermon and I know all these scriptures. And then as soon as I'm faced with a trial, it's as if I'm not even a Christian. Everything just kind of went out the window. I was so excited in church, yelling and screaming during the songs and excited for what the pastor was preaching. And then my coworker treats me disrespectfully and I'm ready to pop off. I think for me personally, this is a topic that is difficult to deal with, but needs to be dealt with in church because we need to know both the advantages and disadvantages of thinking that here is where your growth is primarily going to happen. We have to have a level playing field. Don't hear me saying that coming to church is bad. But do hear me saying that your faith is real. So in order to answer this question, here's what the Lord led me to do. I want you to kind of imagine with me and ponder your soul with me today. And we're going to start off, I forget the name of the uh, uh, um, the. Uh, I mean, not theologist, the guy who said this, but we're going to kind of treat our soul like a blank slate. But what I want you to do is I want you to picture that your soul is kind of like this huge corporate building within you. This is the center of operations for your life. You do what you do based on this building. Okay? And in this building is a position called the core beliefs director, the chief core beliefs director. Now what's happening is the Lord understands our heart and our soul, so he sends us wisdom. Wisdom is going to apply for that position in your soul. 
That's kind of like what's going on here in Proverbs 8. Wisdom is kind of standing before you, wanting this position, and she is giving her resume. So let's see how wisdom approaches this situation and can help us out. Before wisdom starts talking about what you need to do or what's going on in your life, wisdom begins with explaining who she is. Wisdom goes on to talk about how before anything existed, I was there. I was the first of God's creation. Wisdom talks about that before the oceans were created, the stars were created, the mountains were created. I was there before all of those things. And within those things, I was the chief architect. It's interesting. I don't know if any of you guys remember your college days, but if you nowadays go to a college and you get one of those science textbooks and you open it up and you see like the solar system and the human body, man, I mean, you could just get confused looking at the book. There's so many lines and words and definitions of all the different parts in the body and all the different things in the solar system. It's crazy how much we've advanced as time has gone on. But you want to know what else is interesting? Of the thousands and thousands of years that we've been exist in existence. And if you want to believe the evolutionists in billions and billions of years that we've been in existence, what I find very interesting is that nobody can explain why this coat stays together. Nobody. They can tell you what the fabric is made out of. They can tell you why the light refracts and it looks gray, but nobody can tell you why the particles in this coat stay together. Nobody. We know that there's space in between the particles, but there's something in between the space that keeps it together. And that's wisdom. That's what she's arguing. Wisdom is the reason that the oceans have a line that it doesn't cross, yeah. that it continues to stop and go back. Wisdom was there to draw that out. In the thousands or billions of years that human beings have been in existence, to this day, not every organ in the body is even named. This is wisdom's point. Wisdom's point is to say, if I have brilliantly crafted all of nature, crafted all of the laws, crafted everything in the world to be organized in such a way that human beings can thrive, if I worked this position in your soul, if you made me the chief in your soul, imagine what I could do for your life. So she starts by trying to get you to understand the truth. There's a scripture that says that, in, in, in Proverbs 8, that says that when God created humanity, and when God uh, first instituted us, wisdom said, I was there to both form you and to enjoy the work that God had done in producing the family of God. We were a unique and a wonderful creation. God's wisdom is bigger than us. It's bigger than the way that we think and understand and comprehend reality. And so what that means is that God is trying to get you to understand that you don't have to be dependent on your finite ability to understand reality when you can trust God's wisdom to give you greater sense of his glory and purpose. Now some of you guys are like, okay, I get this point, but how does it relate to what you talked about before about the inability to do all that I know? Part of what we have to see is that there are different positions in your soul, just like there are different positions in a corporate building. There is the chief director, 
But then there are also other things like the assistant director. Then there are managers. Then there are entry level positions. And sometimes we have to see or identify within ourselves that the problem that we tend to face is that we allow God in, but he is not yet the chief in our hearts. One of the reasons that I think it's difficult for us to sometimes look at wisdom is because there is a reality that wisdom, you see, I want to say this, there's a reality that wisdom offers a lifestyle that is kind of hard or presents difficulty for us. When you read the Bible and you read what the Bible has to say, it's often challenging you to live, if you really define it honestly, a rather insane life. Uh, for instance, if somebody was to hit you, Jesus taught that you should turn the other cheek to them. If people are hating on you, Jesus taught that you were supposed to love them. That's difficult. That's hard. And honestly, one of the chief and simple reasons that we struggle with doing God's word is because it's hard. That is like the chief operating reason. Because it is hard. We, 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 it's hard. That's what most people say. It's, it's almost like a subconscious answer. But it's interesting when we think about things being hard because we really have to understand what we mean when we say that. What do I mean when I say that it's hard? Uh, am I implying that I was misinformed by God? It, I didn't think that it would present that much difficulty. Maybe I'm implying that what's on the other side can't be worth me going through this much struggle. Maybe it's hard because I don't feel that I am capable to really do what was asked of me. Maybe I feel misled. But what they all have in common is trust. Do we trust God enough to go through difficulties? Now, my wife loves jokes. She's very good at lightening the mood. She likes to find different jokes and different things that people do on social media. One of the things that I found very interesting is that there's this thing that a bunch of pe different people were doing on uh, YouTube where there would be these women, either wives or girlfriends to guys, that would want to kind of test the waters with their man. So what they would do is they would start off by trying to have a conversation with them, maybe talking about their relationship or talking about their life or whatever the thing, whatever the nature may be. And the guys would often say, you know, I'm tired. I've had a long day of work. You know, I've had so much going on. I just need to rest. I can't do this now. Can we do this another time? And you know, that way it happened, right? So then they would let the guys leave. They would let the guys go upstairs. Mind you, it's a Wednesday or a Thursday night. And um, once the guys got upstairs after about five minutes, what the ladies would do is they would go on their phones, and I'm going to pull it up, but they would go on their phones, right, and they would find the Monday night NFL theme song, right? And then after about five minutes, they would play the song really loudly around the house. Ba -da 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 -da. Right? And the song would just go off. And then out of nowhere, it would be like the guy who was tired and who was sleepy and who had so much going on. He would run back down. And the, oh, the game is on. He would run back down all this energy and all this excitement for the game. And as you know, they probably got into a lot of those couples probably got into an argument after that. I'm not suggesting that wives should test their husbands like that. But I am making this point. When something really matters to you, it doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter what state you're in. It doesn't matter what you're going through. When something matters to you, when you care about it, it changes the dichotomy of who you are when you are tired. You see, I meet with students all the time. Students are always hard to deal with. 
They have some crazy beliefs. I'm working with this one guy who is really convinced that it should be okay for him to sleep with multiple women. He's genuinely trying, but he, he just feels that it's okay. And so we talk about it over and over again, and then sometimes I get somewhere, and sometimes we don't. It's a hard thing to do. Students have radical views and all types of histories and past and all these different types of things. But I enjoy every minute of it. Not because I'm more spiritual than you or because I'm a preacher or anything like that. It's because I understand what's on the other side. It's because there is an emotional involvement that helps me to understand it doesn't matter what's hard. It doesn't matter what I'm going through at the end of the day. It's worth what I'm doing. A lot of us struggle with growth because we don't have an emotional relationship with God. All throughout Proverbs, wisdom is calling us to love her, to adore her, to seek her, to value her. And I don't know how to say it except to say it very plainly. It doesn't matter whether you're me, the preacher up here, or Pastor Rich in the pews, whether you're a great person of, of influence like uh, uh, Billy Graham or someone lowly who has no influence like the poor person on the block. If you don't have some type of emotional relationship with God, then you are not going to be able to transfer your faith into action. Now, don't overhear me. I'm not saying that you've got to be a weepy crier every time you come to church and you got to always be crying and be in a sentimental mood. But God ought to mean something to you. You shouldn't be doing this because it guarantees that you go to heaven. You shouldn't be doing this because it makes you look good and because it makes you look positive and upright. There should be a passion leading you towards the kingdom of God. There should be a passion that makes you want to see people get better because what you know about Jesus Christ's death and resurrection on the cross. It shouldn't be about you. It should be about the greater glory of God. And that is often the missing piece. We don't do better because we try harder. This is one of the biggest myths in faith. We don't do better because we try harder. We do better because we learn to love Christ in a deeper way. Your relationship with God works down before it works up. You give up more be before you ascend higher, right? That the reality is God humbles the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. There's got to be an emotional connection with the Father. And I'll be very honest with you, John talks about this in John 15, right before Jesus was telling them, understand that you're not greater than me. You shouldn't, first, that's another sermon for another day, but you shouldn't feel comfortable if you are accepted by the world. Right? But Jesus tells them, here's the good news. The world will hate you. Why? Not because you ugly or because you ain't pretty or you don't got no stuff. It ain't none of that. The world will hate you because it hated the one who saved you. That's right. That's right. It hates what you stand for. It hates who lives inside of you because he teaches light while they choose to live in darkness. But here's the good news. He says that what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you the advocate. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will be inside you as a comforter as a teacher, as a guider into all truth. Uh, I, I want to tell y'all that godly wisdom on a bigger scale is the person and teachings of Jesus Christ. Wisdom on a bigger scale is the Holy Spirit. And if that isn't moving you, if that isn't living inside of you, no amount of church, no amount of outward appeal will change that. We have to relate to God on an inward scale. Because, see, guys, there is a reality that there is another candidate who wants to dwell in your soul. Now, Proverbs labels Satan as folly, foolishness, haughtiness, a prideful spirit. There is this beautiful story in Proverbs chapter 7 
about this one of Solomon's sons. I'm not 100% sure if the Bible makes it clear that this is a real or just a story that Solomon developed to make a point. But basically, it's one of those classic, classic seduction stories that there was a man who was walking around, being in places that he shouldn't be, and to his eye, he caught a beautiful, beautiful woman. She was, I mean, she was gorgeous. Dressed like a prostitute. Yeah, that's right. Dressed like a prostitute, I mean, she was it. And so he looks at her, and then he puts himself around her, and she begins to entice him. Come lay with me. My husband is gone, but he left all his money in the house. She decorates the bed, and y'all can appreciate this even though it was back in biblical times. She decorates the bedroom with perfume. She puts rose petals all over the place, and she's got the place smelling like an Egyptian wonderland. And she says, come lay with me. Come sleep with me, for isn't stolen bread good? Isn't the thrill and the journey of doing this good? And then towards the end, Solomon warns. He warns that this man is on his way to death because underneath her bed is the depths of hell or the depths of Sheol, what is called in Proverbs. Now, here's what I didn't catch the first time that I read this story. Most of the time when you picture seduction stories, we think that, you know, oh, you know, the consequence of basically the story is saying don't get caught up in things like that because you just never know when the consequences will come. You're living in the thrill and this, that, and the third. But what people don't understand is that there's an important thing to understand that you need to catch from that story. From the beginning, the woman's plan was to end the man up in the depths of Sheol. It wasn't an accident or a coincidence or just because he didn't control the situation. It was her plan from the beginning because the point that Solomon is trying to make is that foolishness, uh, a haughtiness, a spirit of the devil is intentionally the most thrilled by your destruction. The reason why we don't sin is not just because it is wrong or we're not supposed to do it. There is a spirit behind sin that wants to injure you, that literally wants you to fall in love with it so that you will hire that spirit to be the core beliefs director in your life. And so you will literally pay that spirit to lead you to death. And I'm using an analogy, but some of you guys know what I'm talking about. We've paid in wasted pictures on social media. We've paid in dating the wrong people. We've paid in getting involved in the wrong places, spending all of our energy on things with being driven by something that intentionally wants to destroy our lives. And this is what I've come to understand the good news is that unlike the devil and his foolishness, unlike the realities of all of the things of how he wants to destroy your life, Jesus is still constantly pursuing after us because he's driven by grace. He wants to give us life. Uh, when I was growing up, my... Uh, one of the first books that really got me thinking deeper in my faith was given to me by my mom called My Heart Christ Home. Um, some of you may be familiar with this book. Um, if you're not, it's a great kind of story. Um, it talks about a person who had first given their life to God, and then it kind of compares their life to a spiritual house. Uh, the person journeys all through this house, and he has weird kind of, inner, not weird, but you know, powerful interactions with Jesus where, you know, he realizes that the way that he keeps his library, the things that he sees, has a lot of images that Jesus wouldn't approve of. Jesus lets him know, confronts him about it, and he changes the room. Uh, then we go to his kitchen. These are the things that are his motivators in life. Same thing. This interaction kind of keeps happening with the set, you know, with his bedroom, with his living room, with his rec room, just all these different aspects of his life. And finally, at the end, they come to this hall closet. 
This is the first time that we have actually seen the character willing to say no to Jesus. You can't go in that way. It wasn't because he wasn't trying to be, uh, he was trying to be disrespectful. His whole closet is where his pain was. That's the parts of him that had been buried so deep. So Jesus told him, I refuse. He said, I'll, I'll stand, I'll lay outside, but I refuse to be in the house if you keep that hall closet smelling the way that it does. And so in tears and fear and having to kind of choose between Jesus and keeping his junk hidden away, he decides off a whim with everything he has in him to give up to let Jesus into that hall closet and instantly he cleans it. The man couldn't believe it. His house had been smelling nasty for years in spite of all of the cleaning that he had done because of this one hall closet. So being blown away by the interchange, the man suddenly comes up with an idea. So he goes down to the store that he bought his house from and he asks the guy for the title or the deed to the house. He comes back to, to his home. He opens the door and there he sees Jesus waiting for him in the, um, in the uh, living room. And he pulls Jesus to the side and he says, you know what? Lord, I've had an epiphany. Each time I try to clean up the different rooms in my life, you clean it and then I find a way to mess it up. Each time I'm working to grow, there's something that happens that I can't handle, and I just kind of keep going back and forth. He said, so I have an idea. What if it wasn't me who any longer was the owner of this home? What if it wasn't me? Because every time, Lord, you came into my house and you cleaned, every time it became like new. So if you owned the home, and that's the message that Jesus wants to give to all of us. I want you to understand that when Jesus came to the world, he was born in a lowly manger in Bethlehem. What good could come out of Bethlehem? Because from the day of his birth, he was trying to prove a point. When he grew up, he grew up amongst the poor. He grew up loving the poor. He grew up healing those who were ostracized by society because he was trying to make a point. Then he was betrayed by the religious church leaders and one of his very own disciples because he was trying to make a point. He went down, uh, he went down, was, uh, was falsely convicted for crimes he did not commit and he died on the cross for our sins because he was trying to make a point. And on the third day, he rose again because the point was made. I did not come to die for those who already think that they are well. I did not come to die for those who, who think that they can handle everything that they're going through. But if you are in a place where you finally understand that life is too big for you, where you finally understand that you can't keep going in the same circle and circle and circle and calling yourself healthy. I have sent my son to die for you and he has the ability to redeem you from the place of death, to pull you out if you follow foolishness into the grave of Sheol. I have the ability to pull you out and make you new because death does not have power over life. The point that wisdom is making is that I was there. Trust me. Let me be the leader. And I will lead you into truth everlasting. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we... <clears throat> We thank you so much for another opportunity to share your word. We thank you so much for another uh, opportunity to just come together in fellowship, um, thinking about you. 
Lord, even now, I ask that those under the sound of my voice may be able to go home thinking about the gift that you gave them. I think, I pray, Lord, that creation would be able to minister to us. When we vacation on the beach with our children or with our friends and family or uh, significant others, I pray that the sand in the ocean just reminds us of what we have dwelling in the inside of us. I pray that when we look up at the sky, even as we leave, that the clouds remind us of what we have inside of us. When we look at the mountains and the trees and the hills and valleys, for the Bible teaches in Romans that even creation testifies to the glory of God. Help us to look with eyes and be just so delighted in the fact that the same wisdom that holds the ocean together, the same wisdom that holds everything in place is the same wisdom that can dwell with inside of us. And though Solomon was speaking metaphorically, I pray that we understand that that is the real truth, that the spirit of Christ can dwell inside of us, giving us power, giving us wisdom, giving us a sound mind. Help us to remember your death on the cross. It's in your name that we say, amen. Amen.
Let me take a shot and kill this of your grace. The creation still makes you so alive, so alive. church. Sure. 